Uh, so Anne is our Virginia Director of Advocacy and Outreach, if I've got your title correct now. And so she gets to manage all of these wonderful things that create advocates in the state of Virginia. And that often includes wonderful restoration work. Anne has a love of horticulture and a background in horticulture. So um, she's going to bring back that love to you guys right now with this wonderful presentation. Anne, is there anything else you want to share about what you do? Uh, thanks, thanks, Blair. That was great. Yeah, All right. So, um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. I'm really, really excited. This is one of my favorite topics. I, I will say, altogether, we had uh, 475 people register for this webinar. So, if that number keeps going up, it's a little scary to me. But um, hey, I'm glad that there's so much interest. Um, let me just start by saying that I've been gardening since I was um, a little, little girl. My grandmother had me planting nasturtiums and French marigolds in her vegetable garden when I was five, six, seven years old. Um, I, you know, our grandparents knew a whole lot about companion plants and, um, and how to ward off predators. Um, the, my mom still tends a garden. It's the envy of all of her neighbors. And uh, but I'll say, and I majored in, you know, in landscape horticulture in English. Uh, but the two things that happened almost a decade ago have really changed the way that I garden and what plants I personally prize. Um, the first was when Dr. Doug Talame released his Bringing Nature Home book. Um, it was eye-opening, and I reference his research throughout the presentation. He's got a new book out that my, my family gifted me for Christmas. Um, re recommend them all. The second was um, I hired Robert Jennings, and if you've ever had the um, the ability to listen to him, he is a gifted educator and uh, and a master naturalist. And he came to my house for dinner on his first day of work, and that was back that was in May of 2012. And he, you know, I was, I was giving him a tour of, our, of my yard and I was so proud of it, right? And I, and I said, I've got a lot of native plants, right? And he just sort of smiled and, and sheepishly shrugged and said, well, you got that really big white, white oak tree in your front yard and some pine trees and all of the back of your yard is wooded. But other than that, no, um, that's about it. So all that to say that conversation started a journey. It's been over 10 years now, and it has started um, really a discovering a wonder that I hope to share with, with you guys today. So uh, let's get started. The first thing is that this slide is really a misnomer. I love alliteration, but we shouldn't just be creating habitat in our backyards only. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, shame on me for even for even having that as a title. And wherever we've got room, that's where we need to put some native plants. All right, so uh, so this is one of my favorite perennials, and it's uh, it's being photobombed by my black lab. Uh, this is cardinal flower. It's a magnet for hummingbirds. But for the next forty five minutes, I'll share with you some some steps you can take to incorporate native plants in your landscape. And I hope that there's a few takeaways that, you, that you'll get from tonight's webinar. Uh, the first is the connection between what we do on our landscape and water quality. Um, the second is why do we need to supply the plants that support the food web to increase biodiversity? And then some, some, design, some design guidelines that sort of will help you make that transition to more natives. And, and then finally, some additional resources that are available to you. So CDF's mission is to save the bay. And, uh, and President Ronald Reagan referred to the Chesapeake Bay as a national treasure. It is really the crown jewel of the world's estuaries. So every drop of rain that lands within this yellow outlined area, that is the bay watershed. Ultimately, that raindrop makes its way through 21,000 streams and rivers and over 100,000 small creeks and unnamed tributaries down to the bay. So what we do on the land, it alters the health of the bay either for good or for ill. And we're making tremendous progress, um, reducing the pollutants that run into the bay. Wastewater treatment plants have really led the way. They 
they have greatly reduced the, the nitrogen and phosphorus that are going in the bay. Air emissions from the coal-fired power plants and car emissions have also gone down, so that's decreased the amount of nitrogen that's going into the bay. And farmers are increasingly adopting best management practices to keep manure and topsoil from running off their land. So those are all good things. Our biggest challenge is stormwater. So that's the water that runs off your streets, parking lots, driveways, turf, and goes untreated into the nearest storm drain. And ultimately that storm drain has an outfall in a nearby creek that converges with a stream into a river and ultimately into the bay. So there's approximately 18 million people who live in the watershed. And those 18 million people are also managing millions of acres of grass lawns. And lawns are better than bare soil, but from a stormwater perspective, they're just about as impervious as your driveway. Virginia's manage over 1 million acres of lawn. So that's more acres than we have in corn or soybeans. And it's more managed turf than the entire state of Rhode Island from a size perspective. So our scientists did some simple math and said that if every homeowner would just take out a 10th of their managed turf and convert that to conservation landscaping and use native plants, we'd reduce the nitrogen loads to the bay by over 250,000 pounds. That's about 13% of the nitrogen reductions needed to fully restore the bay. So this monoculture of turf and non-native foundational plantings, it's not good for water quality, but it also provides no habitat or forage for bees birds and other pollinators. So another reason why native plants are better for water quality, they've got deep roots. So those roots are able to hold the soil in place, they reduce erosion, and they don't require fertilizer because they've, been, they've adapted to this region over millennia. And birds, bees, and butterflies have also co-evolved with these plants. And I'll talk more about those um, special adaptations in just a minute. These deep roots also store carbon, they're drought tolerant. And if you think about um, the roots of switchgrass, for instance, uh, Panica virginiana, they can get in 12 feet. I mean, that's, uh, that's holding a lot of soil. So now I hope I've got you thinking, oh yeah, I can give up a tenth of my lawn. Um, so let's get to the need of the subject, which is, um, you know, why, why does this matter to birds, bees, and butterflies? I'm going to start with the birds. It was a little over a year ago. Um, we were, I think, all shocked, shocked when we read the, the, the New York Times headline that said nearly one third of wild birds in the United States and Canada have vanished since 1970. Like that's in my lifetime. Um, you know, they were reporting on, a, on an article that was in the journal Science that said 2.9 billion birds have disappeared over the, the, the past 50 years. So in Virginia, um, we've converted between 2014 and 2018, we converted almost 200,000 acres of forest to other land uses. So in some cases it was development, in some cases it was utility scale solar, in some cases it went, um, it was timbered and so those trees will be replanted. Um, but that's 200,000 fewer acres of trees to provide shelter and forage for the birds to raise their young. But the good news is about 80% of land is privately held. So your yard and mine, um, and that's a huge opportunity for us to do better. All right, so, you know, our bird feeders are wonderful. They bring the birds to us so that we can watch them. Um, and and our, the adult birds will absolutely eat uh, suet and they'll eat seeds. But the parents have to feed, most parents uh, have to feed their, their young insects. So. I, you know, you got, I think you look at this picture and you sort of got a feel for this mama mockingbird because you can almost hear them go, me, 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 me. right, or at least that's what I imagine they're saying. All right, so um, although this chickadee will visit your bird feeder throughout the year, it only 
feeds caterpillars to its young. And Doug Talamy had a one of his one of his uh, grad students literally watch how many um, caterpillars the chickadee brought back to its to its clutch, and and found out that it takes between six thousand and nine thousand caterpillars to rear a single clutch. That is a lot of little worms. Um, they also forage no more than 50 meters from the nest. So that means your yard and your neighbor's yard, that's their food supply. And you might be um, wondering, well, why caterpillars instead of, um, you know, in, instead of other insects like uh, grasshoppers, for instance. And I'm gonna borrow this example from Doug Talamy again, because it's so perfect. He said, they're like little sausages lots of fat, lots of protein, and there's no exoskeleton like you having a grasshopper or a beetle, so it's a lot easier to regurgitate. So now the question you're, I hope you're asking is, how do we landscape to have more caterpillars? And the answer is trees. Um, and, and, I'll, and so which trees? And, and I'll just say, who knew the caterpillars are picky eaters, but Absolutely, they are. Um, again, according to Doug Calamy's research, that white oak that, um, that Robert noticed in my yard a decade ago, it supports, it's, it and other oak trees are the larval host for over 500 butterfly and moth species. So larva, caterpillar, um, and I'll just say my mother, you know, she sort of wonders, well, why, what have I got against crepe myrtles? And, um, and the answer is they don't support any Lepidoptera. There's, there's really nothing that eats them. All right, so, you know, some, uh, some are very picky eaters. Um, so on the bottom left is the, is a spicebush swallowtail. They only feed on the family Lauraceae. So that includes the red bay, the sweet bay, sassafras, spice bush, all of which are native to Virginia. And then the eastern tiger swallowtail, that's the one on the right, it's gathering nectar from a sunflower, the helianthus family. Its larval host plants include the tulip tree, the wild black cherry, and a sweet bay magnolia. And then the zebra tail butterfly, the larval host plants are the Asymnia species, which are pawpaws, right? And through most of its range, the uh, Asymnia are the, it, that's, the, that's its only host tree. So another specialist is the, the sweet bay silk moth. Um, it was named after the host tree Magnolia virginiana, it, with the sweet bay magnolia, and pulled these cool thing about these moths is they're diurnal and their mating period is in the afternoon. Their lifespan is about two weeks long, which is just long enough to mate and lay eggs. So uh, if we want more caterpillars for baby birds and more butterflies, then we need to include their host plants in our landscapes. We talked a second ago about how valuable trees are to the food supply for a variety of moths and butterflies, but of course there's a very specialized relationship between the monarch butterfly and milkweed. Um, the adult gathers nectar from the flowers and um, they lay their eggs on the underside of the leaves. And when the eggs hatch, the larvae eat the leaves. So milkweed is poisonous. So this adaptation, it's not poisonous to the monarchs, but um, this adaptation protects the monarch from being eaten by birds, right? Because it's, it's very, very bitter. Um, I'll just mention that the swamp milkweed, if you've got a wet location and you've got room to let it go, um, it, it's, it's perfect. It, it can get a little rangy, but again, if you've, got, if you've got a corner of your yard that you've got some extra space, then it'll, it, it does beautifully. And then its it, its counterpart is butterfly weed. That's the one in the, the middle, um, but with the orange flowers. And Asclepias tuberosa stays it stays smaller and, and more compact. It, it, it never looks quite as quite as rangy. See if I can get this to 
I can get. This is a video of these two monarchs fighting over a one milkweed leaf. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. Alrighty, um, so here's another adaptation. So this is a hummingbird moth. It's a clear wing and it's gathering nectar from Minarda. So hummingbird moths, they've got that really long proboscis and it's adapted for pollinating those long tubular flowers. Another example is the tomato hornworm caterpillar. It'll eventually morph into a hawk moth or a sphinx moth. It's got that same long uh, proboscis. All right, so shifting gears just a little bit, let's talk bees. Um, you know, I'll just say a few years ago, I thought that there was a honeybee and a sweat bee and a bumblebee, and that was it for bees. Uh, maybe it may, I found out later about mason bees, but uh, so Virginia's home to 430 native bee species. That just blew me away. So this is uh, Pitothrix bombiforus, I love saying that on rose mallow, it's a hibiscus turret bee. It's also called the Eastern digger bee. And it looks a lot like a bumblebee, but it's not. Um, you know, we see rose mallow a lot in the coastal areas and the wetland areas. The female collects pollen on her legs and then she takes it back to her brood. So Sam Drogi, who's with the USGS Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, he's a biologist. He studied native bees all around the world. And he said um, in one of our voices class, he said 80% of native bees are generalist. They're, they're not that picky what plant they gather pollen from. They'll, they'll fly, you know, plant to plant, doesn't matter. But 20% of them are specialists. And of those, some will only gather pollen from one to two or three species of plants. So very, very limited. Virginia is one of three states most inhabited by specialist bees. So the link here is to the Virginia Native Plant Society. They have a list of plants that support specialist bees. And just at the, the top of the list are, um, you know, willow, the Salix genus. It, it supports eight species of specialist, redbud trees, dogwoods, especially the osier and the silky also support a handful as well as the winter berry, the, um, the holly. And just also note um, that different bees have different breeding cycles. So this one, it breeds from May to September, but others are breeding earlier in the year. Others are breeding say from August to October. So that's just another reason why we need to have as much diversity of flowering plants in our yard as, as we possibly can. All right, so um, not only do birds need trees, but bees do too. In that really early spring, so before stuff in your yard is blooming, um, like you know, a bunch of your perennials, they really haven't started blooming, at least in my yard until, I don't know, that first, early April, mid-April. Um, but once it warms up to about 55 degrees, the bees are out there foraging. So these early flowering trees, the red buds and maples and service berries, they provide that much needed pollen in late March and early April. All right, so I hope we've established why plant diversity is so important in our landscapes. And I hope you're really pumped up and you're ready to set a buffet table for birds, bees, and butterflies. And you're wondering, well, how, where do I start? What do I do first? This is where I'd start. Um, I'd remove, I go out and figure out what in your yard is invasive and remove it before they escape into the wild. Uh, there's just from a practical standpoint, the sooner you do this, the easier the job will be. Um, but more importantly, they're taking up valuable real estate that you can, you can swap out something that's non-native. Um, and let me back up for a second. You can, swap, you can swap out an invasive for a native. Um, and, but there, there are lots and lots of, of common landscaping plants that are 
uh, that aren't native that are absolutely fine. They're just not providing the same habitat value that the natives can. So if you're wondering, well, is, uh, you know, is this, uh, is this plant native or, or is it invasive? One clue is if it's, if it's green in February, this time of year, it's probably, it's probably invasive, right? I mean, that, that characteristic lets it grow year round. And that's why in this leaf litter, this picture was taken at Belle Isle, um, in, which is part of the James River Park system at Richmond. And you see, uh, you know, privet, honeysuckle, and English ivy in that leaf litter. So, you know, that, that area, if it wasn't completely overtaken by invasives, in late February, early March, we would start seeing the spring ephemerals um, pop up in that leaf litter. So the other, if you're also wondering, so okay, so I've got, I've got, let's say you got a lot of invasive plants in your yard. Um, I'd say start with the vines. Um, they're a danger to trees and people and structure. And interestingly, ivy, which when it's crawling on the ground, um, it's you say, well, it's not that bad. It's it's a great ground cover. But once it starts to go vertical, then the birds disperse the seeds. And that's why it's showing up in disturbed soils miles and miles away from where it was initially planted. So uh, blueridgeprism.org is a great nonprofit. They offer individual plant sheets, excuse me, fact sheets about the most common invasive species uh, when it was introduced as well as treatment options. But the Virginia Department of Forestry is also a great resource. They've got um, on their web page, uh, this, this is a, just a screenshot. They, they indicate the best time of year to treat and whether you've got to do mechanical or chemical treatment. So, um, you know, two, two excellent resources for invasive control. All right. Um, so invasive species are, are common, but they're also commercially available. So I would just encourage you to ask for and purchase natives at the nursery. Eventually, the nurseries will stop carrying invasives. So common yardscape, excuse me, common landscape plants that are spreading outside of your yard and, and into disturbed soils elsewhere, there are lots of great alternatives. So um, Mandina, seen here on the left, its berries are toxic to birds. Um, again, it's getting outside of where it was initially planted. Autumn olive on the right, it was initially planted by, uh, I think, Department of Wildlife as a way to, um, to stop erosion, uh, particularly along uh, roadways. But it has, it has also spread like crazy. And of course, barberry, calorie pear, you know, Bradford pears. It's really interesting. Those, when those trees were originally introduced, they were sterile. And so everybody thought, well, it's okay. It's a pretty tree. It's, you know, got this nice columnar form. It's okay to introduce it. Well, um, you know, Mother Nature's smarter than we are and it absolutely uh, broke that sterility in one of its uh, mutations. So that's why on the edge of woodlands, we see uh, Bradford, tear, bleh, Bradford pears taking over the edge of woodlands. Um, another plant that kind of we're just starting to see on the edge of woods everywhere is a winged burning bush. Um, a lot of gardeners love this plant because it's got a burst of crimson color, the Euonymus allatus, but it's also popping up along wooded areas. Along, If you're driving north on Highway 17, for instance, if you're going through Falkir County, you will, you know, you'll see it on the right hand side of the road just um, for two to three miles. And you're just going, this wasn't planted here. <laughs> it, 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 doesn't, um, it doesn't belong there. And then the genus Miscanthus is another that uh, is commonly available in, um, you know, in nurseries. There's about 20 different species 
but this, this grass species again um, is spreading outside of where it's initially planted. All right, so uh, does this picture look like a toilet on wheels to you? <laughs> uh, all right, so now, now you know why I'm not a professional landscape designer, because uh, even with CAD software, I can't, I don't draw a whole lot better pictures. Um, but now let's say you've removed invasive species and you're wondering, well, where, where are you going to put those con the conservation garden or that, the, your conservation landscaping? So I'll, I'll start with the obvious, which is where grass doesn't thrive, right? Sometimes you're in your yard, it's too shady, it's too wet, it's too dry. Maybe you've got um, a hillside, it's too dangerous to mow. These are great places to, to consider, um, you know, putting in conservation landscaping. And just a reminder to a previous slide that native plants have deeper roots. They are really good about holding the hillside in place once you get them established. But the, what might be helpful is to just create a, a sketch of your property. So that's what that picture on the left is supposed to be, uh, my toilet on wheels. It's, um, it, it, so towards the top is my driveway, then there's my house in the back, there's a patio. So you know, I've got this, this sort of weird triangular shaped lot but it's really easy to just Google your property, switch over to satellite view. If you right click, you'll bring up a, a, a menu that'll let you measure the distance as well as the area. And that'll just give you a sense of, okay, how much do I actually have in turf, right? Um, so I'll just say from a scale perspective, a, a half inch equals 10 feet. That usually fits pretty well on an eight and a half by 11 piece of, um, of graph paper. So for a quarter acre lot, it's, um, you know, it'll, it'll do great. You have to change the scale if you've got five acres, but um, I'll leave that to you, you guys are smart. So, uh, okay, you got your grid. I would say make lots of uh, copies of it and, and walk around because you're going to take notes on your, on your baseline. Okay, so, uh, so step number one, what are you looking for? So I, the first thing I note on your graph paper is your exposure. And it, so a northern exposure, for instance, it won't have full sun until the seven months. And uh, so for, and if let's say you, you want to cool your house, then you would plant trees on a southern exposure as an example, so that you so you can create some additional shade. Uh, from a view perspective, you know, maybe your neighbor's yard looks like a used car lot. And so you don't want to look at that. Maybe you want to create a green screen. Uh, or maybe you've got this really lovely water view, a pond or the bay. And that's something, that's a view that you want to frame. Um, it's helpful also to know the history of the property. I wish I knew before we moved here that um, our property was once the neighborhood tennis court. So you can imagine, we actually have zero topsoil. When you start digging down, you can go about two inches and then you start hitting cinder because that was the, the under, under the pavement, under the um, tennis court. And it also greatly affected the, uh, the soil chemistry. So that's, um, by comparison, I, we also looked at this house that used to be a stable and the lady told me, oh yeah, you know, it was stables. It, there was a stable here for, for 200 years. And you, she said, and I can grow anything. Well, of course, all that um, composted horse manure over the years was just tossed outside the stable. So sure enough, she had a lot of deep, rich organic soil. And I'm of course jealous. Um, all right, so look at where water runs on a property. Uh, and also, where does it pool? Um, look at uh, which areas of the yard are sunny, what's in full shade, know where your utilities run. Of course, you're, before you dig, you're always going to call 1888 um, as utility. And, uh, and over time, after you've been there for a while, you'll know whether you've got deer and rabbits and voles and groundhogs and other critters that you got to deal with. So the first step is really just observe what, what do you have? 
so the second step is to inventory what you've got. Um, so, uh, you know, natural communities are this. If you were to go into a wilderness area and you observe what's growing there and you see which plants grow with one another, um, the plants that grow at a site typically that's closely related to the abiotic factors, such as the bedrock type, the soil chemistry, the slope, the elevation. And you would want to go to the nearest, as close as you can have undisturbed. And so wildernesses, I don't think we have any true wilderness um, or very little left in Virginia. Um, but you want to mimic those natural communities as best as you're able to to ensure that what you put in your yard is going to thrive. Um, DCR has got a list of natural communities. Um, and so it's, a, it's an excellent reference. And then uh, the second thing is Marie Kondo, you know, she talks about, uh, you know, giving away what you don't love. And so I would say we all need to Marie Kondo our gardens. Um, if it does, let it go if it doesn't bring you joy. So on this picture, it's just funny. It's this plant to me is one of the most joyful ever, this woodland phlox. I'll say the deer and rabbit love it. So it can't live in my front yard because um, I get pretty much deer browse in the front, but the back is fenced. So um, I've put it in the back and I've got some sedum around it and the rabbits don't eat the sedum. So they pretty much have left this woodland flocks alone. So, so um, when, you're, when you're done walking around with your, uh, with your sketch, you wanna know how many species of non-native plants do you have? How many species of natives do you have? And, and of your non-natives, which ones do you just really not care for? Right? They're just not doing it for you anymore. Okay, so you know what you've got. And so here are some ideas to help you transition. So some ways to plant with pollinators in mind. So I wanna encourage you to think in two dimensions, both the time of year that something blooms as well as the vertical layer that it fits in. Um, and then, when I say vertical, I mean both above and below ground. Because interestingly, you know, in a really small area, you can have a lot of plant material because the, the roots don't necessarily all go in the same place, right? Some go uh, deep and narrow and some go wide. So it's often, um, you can often get more plant material per square foot and still meet all the nutrient needs of the plants that you're putting in there. So, you want bloom throughout the seasons. You want to think about every layer. And you also want large drifts. Um, that's, that's for efficient foraging. Uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, we'll, we're asked to come out and consult sometimes on, on different people's gardens. And they'll have, you know, one, one plant. Um, or, and, and then they'll have another one. And then they'll have another one. And so it just sort of looks like the uh, hopscotch of, of plants. And, and that's, that's absolutely fine if you're trying to test out something and see if it's gonna work in your yard before you make a big uh, financial commitment to that plant. Uh, but if you've got room and your site matches its needs and try to plant three to five, um, try to stick with odd numbers. And, uh, and just remember that you, you really want a lot of diversity. Um, so in this example, I just want to show you. So we've got spiderwort here in the, in the spring and there's uh, chives to the left of the spiderwort, but tucked underneath that spiderwort, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but tucked underneath that spiderwort are, um, are both asters and, um, and daisies that when that spiderwort starts to, um, you know, to, to look, crumpled and, and start to dry up later in the summer, other stuff takes over where, where that is and it'll still be there next spring. So I'll just advance the slide. 
so this is looking from the other direction. Um, but this is, you know, the Ruta Beck is there in the fall. And, um, and I don't know if you can see in the far, in the far end over here. So now the pea is blooming over here. That's what's up at the top of that slide. Um, and then when this rutabecca is done, then I've got um, asters and goldenrod that, that, take, that take over in the fall. Again, all, all pretty much in the same space. So uh, a lot of people say, I'm not sure I've got room. Uh, you, you may have more room than you think. Uh, if you've got a shed or an arbor or a fence that you want to add some color to, you can add the coral honeysuckle or trumpet creeper to attract um, hummingbirds. So this coral honeysuckle, it's a host to 33 spring caterpillars. So that includes the spring blue azure butterfly as well as clear wing moths and its fruits attract birds. And then of course there's the native clematis, uh, clematis virginiana or, or, or virgin's bower. It's really lovely. It's got these really gorgeous, delicate white flowers. On the left-hand side of the slide is, is passion flower or may pop. Um, you know, it, it, that when it stops, well, I guess in the, in the right behind the letters over there, you can see that uh, the green fruit that's in the background. So that's edible, um, but it makes a loud pop when, it, when it's crushed, which is how it gets its common name. All right, um, so let's go down to the ground. Uh, I personally, I'm in love with ferns. There are dozens of species of ferns that are native to Virginia, and they've got a surprisingly wide tolerance for soil types and sunshade requirements. A lot of people say, oh no, it's gotta be moist for them. It's gotta be, um, you know, they, they have to be in deep shade. And that's not true. I mean, there's a, there is absolutely a, a mix of ferns out there. Um, this, the picture that's on the, the bottom right, the wild geranium, that blooms in, uh, in April and May, and then, and then it's gone. And, and I say it's gone, meaning the plant's still there, but you can just barely, barely see it. And this is underneath of um, the, a button bush. And so, you know, when the button bush starts blooming, it would shade this plant out anyway, but the button bush doesn't fill out its leaves until after this has gotten all the sun it needs to produce the flowers and reproduce. So um, took this took these pictures in, in a neighbor's yard. So these are may apples and, and Solomon seal, and if, and also you can see a few. Um, uh, it's not daisies, uh, violets. Yeah, I think that's violets in the in the middle of the picture. Is ground covers, and the the may apple blossoms are are so cool. They um, they're under the blossoms are underneath those really large leaves, and and so this flower you, it, when it's finished it'll ripen into this small green fruit, and then they're eaten by the box turtles, and the box turtles will carry those around, and this is how new colonies of may apples get um, started in the woods. So, uh, you know, from a small perennial, I just, there were a few that I wanted to draw your attention to. One is green and gold. Again, this is a neighbor's yard, perfect for rock gardens. Um, but two others that I probably should have mentioned, I don't have photos of, are the partridge berry. It is just a, um, a really sweet plant, hugs the ground, um, and it, very small green leaves, but little red berries as well as a foam flower. So it spreads by rhizomes. It's also a really strong ground cover as well as mosses and violets. Um, you know, violets also support a bunch of moths. So, you know, another perfect plant for, um, for ground covers. All right, so we're gonna layers. We're going up um, from a vertical perspective and we'll talk about the shrub layer for a second. Um, I'll just say that the very first thing that we did when we moved to Fredericksburg, so we've been here six years, is we pulled up the winged burning bush that was here and replaced it with Virginia sweet spire. So this is um, Itea virginica, as well as an oak leaf hydrangea in the back of the picture. 
And you see, um, you, you can see strawberries in this bed and in between the strawberries are, are onions and lettuce as well as parsley and, and borage and asparagus. Remember what I said about our grandparents understanding that um, companion plants help ward off diseases and, and pests and that would easily do in my strawberries. So, um, you know, thank goodness we have grandparents. All right, speaking of the burning bush, I, I'll just say that some people say, well, what should I replace it with? So this is a picture of just a, a blueberry. Blueberries give you that same gorgeous fall color, but with the added benefit of fresh blueberries, right? Um, and yes, you absolutely need acidic soil. They prefer between, I think, 4.8 and 5.5, which is pretty much on the acidic side, but you can always amend the soil to accommodate your needs. All right, so um, Alex verticillata, the, the winterberry holly, it also prefers acid soil. Um, there's the a sweet bay magnolia. I'll just mention this fence that's on the left-hand side of the slide for the, the left image. That currently is gone. Um, and I wish I'd taken a picture of this this summer. I took this when we first moved in, we pulled up all this grass and, and put in a whole bunch of natives. And now I, when I counted this summer, we had 20 different um, species of natives in this little tiny strip. All of them are thriving um, and, and it doesn't look overcrowded. Something's blooming all the time, which is really what you're, what you're trying to, to work towards. And then of course the viburnums, this is a picture of the, of the airwood viburnum. Of course, there's the possum hall. There's the, I've got two or three viburnums in, in the backyard and they, they're just plants that don't need a whole lot. And as long as I sort of trim them back a little bit, they, they're just happy as they can be. They're pretty carefree, pretty hardy. So if you've got a really wet area, these guys will do great. This is a red twig dogwood. Um, if you, you can see that it's capturing rain from that downspout um, in the upper left-hand corner of the slide in the fall, it's got, it turns and stays a gorgeous red stem color. It loses its leaves. And, um, you know, you can cut it back hard. You can bring those red stems in around Christmas time, um, but it, it's gorgeous. And of course it's got these really beautiful flowers. All right, so I'm gonna go up a layer and talk about some small understory trees. So of course the red buds and dogwoods will thrive in that dappled shade. Uh, so if you've got taller trees, you can absolutely plant these smaller ones underneath it. Some other the small trees, these um, would do better in, in a sunnier location. The fringe tree, the hornbeam, pawpaw, if you've got a really wet area, really would like you'd prefer to be along a river bank or, or a seep or natural spring. Um, service berries uh, also, they come in both um, multi-stem variety as well as single stem. The single stem to me, uh, it's, a, it's a nice little tree. Uh, sometimes it's got some weird shape. I actually like the, the multi-stem the multi, um, the multi -stem and keeping it as a shrub better. Of course, sassafras is a beautiful little tree, nice understory tree. And then the sweet bay magnolia. Um, I've had a lot of luck with those in, in Fredericksburg. They've done really, really well. Okay, uh, going up again. <laughs> People always ask me, they say, Ian, what's your favorite tree? And that's like telling you like which of my two daughters is my favorite child. Um, so just all of them, there, I will say there are multiple photos of uh, of me in my phone hugging trees. So it's, I will say I'm partial to oaks and river birches and I love the smooth red um, and bright leaves of a black gum. I love the copper leaves of beaches. I mean, I don't know what's not to love. So, uh, so the river birch on the left, a winter storm had just passed through and then all of a sudden in the late afternoon, the sun popped up so you can see the clouds in the back and then the, the light just reflected off of this, um, you know, the white bark of this river birch. I just thought it was remarkable. And then that, that elm on the right hand side. So that's one of the, um, 
I'll say the last of the giant American elms. It's that's on the campus of Penn State, and of course they they've treated all of all of their elms. And just a just a reminder about uh, about natural communities and, and planting what's in your region, and think about the value that it brings to wildlife. So oaks, cherries, etc. All right, so this is just a quick list going back to something I mentioned a few slides ago about the number of, um, so this is the common name, the genus, and then the number of Lepidoptera that's supported by, by each of those genuses. Again, those oak trees supporting over 500 different species, um, followed by wild black cherry, willow, birch, poplar, crabapple, um, the list gets smaller as you go down, but the native trees are supporting a tremendous amount of, of, um, of caterpillars. So I put this slide in here just to indicate that you, you don't need a lot of space to add a lot of diversity. Um, this is a, a garden that we worked on in Hopewell. She had some, some sedum and we, we added asters and goldenrod and little blue stem and also gave her a couple of containers um, that she could put on her porch that she had said that she had some, um, some containers that attracted pollinators. And if, even if you live on a balcony or you've got a terrace, you know, pollinators can fly and they'll, they'll find them. If you had milkweed up in a, um, you know, up on a, a third story balcony, they would absolutely find your milkweed. So um, just before you head out to the nursery, uh, I'd encourage you to invest in the soil trust first. Um, that there's huge value in knowing the pH, what, how acidic or how um, alkaline your soil is. So if the, if the pH is too low, so things like azaleas and hollies and camellias might be happy, but we've talked about the importance of trees and most of the trees are not gonna like the, that lower pH. So we wanna make sure that the nutrients are available. You may have to add some lime before you start planting your trees. And it's also worth it to pay that extra $4 to know the amount of organic material in your soil. Um, that's something that, that as soon as you know it, you'll go, ooh, I, you know, maybe I should leave that leaf litter um, and, and let it decompose naturally on my soil. Okay, so I, I know we've got one person from Del Delaware, one person from New Jersey, and uh, maybe a dozen people from Maryland. So I'm sorry for you guys, but for those of you who live in Virginia, these little books will change your life. Um, so they're on the plantvirginianatives.org website. They are free for you to download. You can order um, a printed copy and have it shipped to you. But you know the plants that do really well in Virginia Beach and Norfolk aren't necessarily going to do well um, up in Harrisburg or in the Shenandoah Valley or or you know, they, they may not be able to tolerate the cooler temps or the higher elevations of what we got in the Western region. And these books do a great job of illustrating the regional differences of which plants grow best where. So another, another helpful website is the Native Plant Nurseries. Um, so, I mean, the Virginia Native Plants Society website they have a list of all the nurseries. Um, they also list spring plant sales, seed swaps. They have an annual workshop, or they used to have a great one before COVID. Now I think it's it's a hybrid workshop, um, but it's a tremendous it's a tremendous resource. And then um, there is in Virginia the, the soil and water conservation districts have a program called BCAP. Um, the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program. So it, the, I put the website down at the bottom of the slide, but they've got financial resources for conservation landscaping, and it's anywhere from 50 to 75% of cost share, depending on the practice that you install. The picture that's shown here is a rain garden, but, but, it, actually, but it will absolutely pay for sort of the turf to trees conversion that we've been talking about a lot in these slides. So um, 
you know, maybe, maybe you're all in and you want to completely overhaul your landscape and you don't know where to start, I'd encourage you to check out the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals. So this is a certification program for sustainable landscape projects. Um, there's both level one and level two certifications. I'll also mention that if you um, live in um, South Richmond in zip codes 23224 or 23234, then we, we currently we've got some grant money and we're designing and installing five conservation gardens. And so just shoot me an email if you're in those zip codes and you're interested, we'll come out and do a site visit. Okay, so I hope that you're, um, you know, that I met the objectives of the, the presentation. Looks like it's 7.23, so we pretty much ending uh, this part on time. I just, I hope you're inspired to shrink your lawn and some ads, add some native plants. I'll just say the declining population of birds and bees and butterflies, it's pretty alarming. But all of us, the fact that we have over 470 people register for this webinar um, tells me that there's a lot of interest in reversing course. And I'll just say we have, everybody on this call I'm sure has planted the wrong plant in the wrong place. And we have killed a few by accident, and that's okay, because we learn by doing. Um, so visit the amazing public gardens we've got in our space, in our state, peruse the spring native plant sales, and take a chance on a new native to bring habitat, you know, back in your yard. And so you've got just this, on this picture, you can see, I think I counted 17 bees in just this shot. So. Um, I won't make you sit there and count them all, but it's, uh, I've, I've actually got a little video of the slide somewhere and they're just buzzing all around. All right, Blair, let's, let's start our Q&A. Yes, thank you so much. Wonderful, Anne. And I will say selfishly, you don't know this, but I have to write a restoration plan for grad school. So this was a wonderful review. Um, you got a bunch of questions. So let's start from the top. Does swamp milkweed spread too much or does it stay contained? Yeah, great question. Uh, I don't know what too much is. <laughs> so swamp milkweed absolutely will spread. Um, that's why I said if you've, if you've got space for it, um, you know, you can always pull it up. It's, it's not like it's going to go from, let's say you put it in an area that was uh, two feet by three feet. It's a six square feet. It's not going to double the next year. So, you know, yeah, I would say give it a chance. Put it like in a little back corner of your garden where it where it's going to get full sun. It's not going to take over the rest of your yard, but um, you can you you will occasionally have to pull it up a little bit if it really loves where it is. Oh no, my yard has been overrun by beautiful plants. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, after that, somebody asked, how does CBF combat HOA requirements for manicured lawns? They drive me crazy. You know, it's funny. I got an email from a member or a friend of a member just, a, just last week, I think. Um, and then Kathy Ledick and Renee Gree both forwarded me a question that said, hey, my HOA won't let me, um, wants to requires that I have a manicured front yard. I don't think they care what happens in your backyard, but wanted a manicured front yard. And they were asking whether or not we could support legislation that would um, allow a property owner to do whatever they want. I mean, to have statewide legislation that allowed that to be a local ordinance. Um, so I, you know, and they were, uh, they were asking that question because they said, you know, in Texas and in California, there's a lot of um, ability to to require, you know, xeriscaping, right, which is, you know, landscaping without water. And, and but that's sort of a different thing. And I don't think we can model the legislation off of that. I don't have a suggestion for your HOA other than most HOAs have a board and take it up with the board. Right, you know, you can always vote on it and you can always vote in new board members. So I think that's what I would suggest before there's legislation. You can attract more uh, friendly board members with beautiful flowers. <laughs> you see what I did there? 
Okay, um, which type of buffalo grass is native to Virginia? The one that is also called prairie grass or St. Augustine grass? It's a very grass specific question. I don't know the answer. I will look it up. So let's table that one, okay? Yes, and I'm keeping a record for everybody that's listening. I'm keeping a record of all the questions. It's all tied to this program. So if we can't answer a question or don't have time to, we, we can get back to you. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm looking it up right now. Well, I will say for the people that ask questions about specific nurseries and specific plants, especially if you're outside of Virginia, I tried to find some tools for you guys, but CBF does have offices in every state. So you're welcome to call our offices in your state and ask um, for a restoration staffer. And even if they don't have the answer, um, they can point you in the right direction. So just wanted to point that out to those of you that asked. Do you need some more time to find the grass question, Ian? No, it's funny because I'm looking at a page of all the native grasses in Virginia and I'm not seeing buffalo grass. So I'm going to have to get back to you and I'm sorry about that. Uh, this is uh, another specific question that I also missed. So uh, why were caterpillars better than insects like grasshoppers? Oh, because, yeah. So, yeah, it's because uh, the mother bird regurgitates, right? And you can imagine trying to, um, to chomp down and regurgitate a beetle or a grasshopper that have got chitin, which is that exoskeleton, it's really hard. And you can imagine that would sort of get stuck in your throat if you're trying to regurgitate and feed your baby bird. So those uh, caterpillars are soft and squishy and they're easier for them to regurgitate back to the, the baby birds. Wonderful. You've received several questions about pests. So um, are there any ways you can use native plants to uh, control rabbits, moles, voles, or any plants they don't like? Uh, um, there is a, uh, somebody told me once upon a time that if you plant eupatorium around your, around your favorite plants, that that will help keep the voles away from them. I will say I was not successful. Um, the best thing that I found for uh, to keep voles away was a red tail hawk and um, and black snakes, right? So, uh, right, I because you know, I guess I'm all about the the um, sort of the natural balance of things. Uh, I'm also really not great about deer um, in terms of giving you. Uh, there is a whole list in those native plant guides about deer resistant plants. So that's another pest. I I have in my front yard, sometimes I put um, the netting over top of it. It's, it's green netting, you really can't see it, but it does sort of limit the amount of damage the deer can do. There are also spray, you know, applications that of everything from, you know, a pepper mix to, you know, deer off. And the only bad thing about those is you have to reapply them after it's rained two to three times. And, and I'm just too lazy to do that. So I usually just put something over top of the stuff that I really, really want um, to keep from being browsed. If it wasn't challenging, would it be worth it? I, I don't know. So mm -hmm. let's see. This is a great question. This is, but this, if I had to pick a favorite question, this might be it. Um, I have a very high water table, about 12 inches from the surface mm. in my front and backyard. Will I have difficulty growing native plants? All right, so I was trying to figure out where that person's from. I mean, I mean I'm guessing it's either on the Eastern Shore or like Virginia Beach or Norfolk, right? Um, so a couple things to think about. Will you have difficulty growing native plants? No, if the plants that you select, if you're on the Eastern Shore or if you're, you know, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, and you've got salt intrusion, right? If our, or if you've got, you know, soluble salts, you're gonna have to, to pick salt tolerant plants. Um, the native plant booklets 
that, um, that I, I pictured a few slides back. There is one for Hampton Roads and there, is, there are specific salt tolerant plants listed there. Um, that 12 inches though, that you talk about for your, your water table also means that you probably, um, if you're in a low lying area, it's gonna frequently flood. So you've also gotta have what I call dry foot wet, wet foot plants, which are ones that don't mind being inundated occasionally. And there are some that um, you know will do just fine. Uh, so the way to sort of figure that out would be, like if you're buying plants from Sandy's Plants, for instance, which is one of my favorite retail nurseries, you got to go there just to drive the golf carts around in the garden. But um, you know, if you're there, they've got great um, they've got a great listing of of plants that do well in rain gardens, and the reason is that rain gardens also get inundated and then they'll dry completely out. And so you need, there's a, not a long list, but there are, there's a list of plants that will do well in both those really wet as well as really dry conditions. And that's what I would, that's what I would try to, to reach for, for those um, high water table areas. And just while you're on the subject, I know not everyone's in Virginia, but there were many questions about where do I find these plants? Uh, do you want to briefly touch on some of the nurseries that you're familiar with? Um, you know, again, I'm going to, I refer back to the native plant. Maybe I should get back to that slide, but the native um, plant of Virginia website, Virginia Native Plant Society website because they've got a list of native, excuse me, a list of nurseries on their website and they do a really good job of keeping it up to date. And because most of the work that I do is in central Virginia, I tend to use the nurseries that I know have great plant material in central Virginia. Um, you know, I get, I'll say we get a lot of the stuff that we plant from, from Sandy's because, you know, she's got such a great variety but I don't want to shortchange other nurseries because you know Charlottesville's got a bunch of great native plant nurseries and Northern Virginia does too. So I would just encourage you to check out the Virginia Native Plant Society website for that. Yes, and I'll pop that link into the chat as well so you guys can take a look uh, in one second. So uh, next question, We've got so many good questions. Ooh, this is a good one too. When you do get rid of invasives, can they be composted and how should you properly dispose of them? Um, I, you know what? I don't compost my weeds. That's a great question. Um, some people have said, oh, don't worry about it. The, seed, you know, the temperature of the compost will get high enough that it will kill the weed seeds. I've also pulled compost out and had weeds pop up out of it. So I'm not ever doing that and so generally I will bag them up uh, you know I'll, I'll let them dry out as much as I can so that the, there's not a whole lot of mass to it and I take them to the dump and if they want to compost them they can but I don't put mine in the compost I will chip it you know like if it's a, a heaven bush or a mimosa bush um, you know that's not going to come back so yeah you could you could wood chip that and it's not a big deal and just put that in the rest of your wooded area, but I probably wouldn't try to compost something that has any seed heads on it. Wonderful. To that point, um, I really want to know how you're going to answer this one. <laughs> Should Nandinas be removed from our landscape? And there were two question marks, so I could feel the stress coming through for this person. I know. I know. Um, yeah. Look, I know they've got really beautiful berries and I got a lot of, um, not pushback, but I guess a lot of concern. The, the berries are toxic to birds. They will eat them um, sort of when there's nothing else left, right? I mean, it's like they sort of know better, but they, they'll still chomp on them and that's how they're spreading. Um, so that they're not my favorite plant. I will say I've got, there are some dwarfs that don't bury. So if you never see a berry on your Nandina, you may have one of the dwarfs that just doesn't bury. And I would say, yeah, leave it. It's not hurting anything. I mean, it's taking up real estate, but that's, you know, that's your prerogative to keep it in your yard. 
But if you got one of the ones that, um, that produces berries, cut them, cut the berries and bring them inside so that the birds don't eat them. If it's, some, if it's a tree, excuse me, a bush that you really wanna keep in your yard. I always really value that you would tell people just do what you can manage and, and sometimes maybe some things out of your your uh, ability at that moment. So I put Nandina's maybe in that category. Speak from experience as I'm trying to get my parents to take them out right now. <laughs> okay, uh, lovely questions. Uh, to help with water runoff. Ooh, this might not even be a plant question exactly. What are the best options for driveways instead of paved driveways? Mm -hmm. um, permeable driveways, right? I mean, so the, you know, the, the, the other, one of the other practices that VCAB, the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program will pay for is the removal of your asphalt is one um, thing that they will pay for. But then a second sort of project is putting in permeable pavers. So those pavers have got an underlayer uh, or a reservoir, if you will, of gravel underneath the pavers and will hold um, the water that is, you know, collect what used to be running off of your driveway will now sort of slowly seep back into the soil. As long as you've got, you know, some infiltration, you're not trying to put it over top of, you know, red clay that doesn't infiltrate at all. So I, I think I would say, um, either permeable pavers or permeable asphalt are both good replacements for just, you know, your standard asphalt driveway. I, before, before we move on, let me just add that, you know, crushed gravel eventually gets to be just as, just as, imper, just as impermeable, it won't let water through um, as, you know, as asphalt. So that's really not a great, um, you know, a, a great solution either. Where are you muted? No, again, I said it earlier, three years and I'm still gonna do it. Yep, me um, too. <laughs> there are a lot of questions people are asking for specific help um, in their location. We'll kind of touch on those in a second, but I wanna wrap up a few other questions that might be generally applicable. Um, so how can you lower pH effectively? Our soil is very alkaline. Uh, yeah, so sulfur, right, as an amendment. Well, will lower it, uh, just like lime raises the pH, sulfur will lower it. And, um, you know, there's, there are, there are lots of, um, I don't remember the brand name for it, but there are lots of uh, soil amendments in the, in the garden tone type of, um, of bag. And it'll, it'll say, you know, to lower pH specifically, and it's got the rate, the application rate there on the bag, depending on how much square footage you're treating. Um, this question as well, my zinnias end up moldy. Why? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's mildew, right? Um, and they generally speaking, it happens later in the season. So the very beginning of the year, you don't usually see a lot of it, but uh, you know, zinnias are wonderful. They keep blooming through September and into October. But of course, what happens in September and October is we start to get condensation as the nights get cooler. And that has that allows that moisture to collect on the leaves. And once that happens, then you know you'll get some mildew on them. So I cheat. Um, you know, zinnias are one of those plants. You gotta love them, right? I mean, it's an annual, it's not a perennial, that uh, the more you cut it, the more it blooms. And so just keep cutting it because it's every time you cut it and cut it as deep into it as you can where there's a natural, um, you know, a natural branch and it'll, it'll send up new, you know, new growth. There are also lots of different um, varieties that come out every year and, um, you know, and it'll say on the seed pack whether or not it's mildew resistant or not when you're ordering, because that's one of the things that the, you know, the, the, the growers and have, um, you know, have, have treated, I mean, have uh, selected seeds for. 
Wonderful answer. Uh, you have two or three questions here. I think this is hugely important um, that kind of are centered around where do I start? These people seemed overwhelmed. It makes me sad. <laughs> uh, yeah, it makes me sad because I was like, I was really trying to, to make sure it wasn't overwhelming. Um, yeah, so if you want, I would just say, if you want to do this yourself, like I said, the first thing is walk around your yard and see what you've got that you know is invasive because the sooner you get rid of it, the easier your life is going to be because it'll keep spreading right and that so yeah get rid of your invasives first and then you know just plant what you love don't just go to the nursery you know in april and go ooh, i want all of these right you want to go multiple times of the year because you want things that are blooming in your yard multiple times of the year and sometimes we get um like we all make that trip early in the spring and we're like, oh, look at that. I've never seen that plant before. And we bring it back and we're really excited. We put it in the ground and, and that's great. Our, 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 our gardens transition over time, right? They're, they're, they're never gonna look the same one year to the next. And there's stuff that I put in the yard. I was like, why did I ever plant that? I hate that plant. Um, but just do what you can and don't, worry about perfection because even one plant right just one native is better than no natives so we said get rid of invasives the second thing i'd say plant a tree right it, it what uh what is that proverb the best day to plant a tree was 20 years ago the second best day is today the same you get some native trees in your yard the happier um all the birds and bees and butterflies are going to be we have a couple of questions that are kind of tied to that um let me see i wanted to focus on a different one but this one caught my eye first um once you begin planting natives how soon should you expect more wildlife to come around oh um i when immediately I, I mean, absolutely, they'll find it. Um, so, you know, I was talking earlier about there being a one-to-one -one relationship between some plants and the lepidot the lepidotra, that the ball, the moths and butterflies that that the it's the larval host for. But almost go out and look. Once you plant those. Go check underneath those leaves. And I must guarantee with the same season you plant it, you're going to start seeing eggs on the bottom of those leaves, right? Um, you know, I, just an, another question that, that might pop up, I haven't seen it yet, which is, well, I'm not okay. Somebody might say, well, I'm really not okay with the caterpillars eating my you know, my tree down to the ground. And last year, I had the most amazing, no, two years ago, I had the most amazing, um, you know, 10 caterpillars took over a swamp white oak. And like, the it just completely uh, devoured it. There were only a few green leaves left when these guys were done. And I'm like, should I get rid of them? Or is it going to be okay? Will it come back next year? So that's what I was worried about. And I was like, yeah, I'll just sort of watch and, and see if, if this experiment is going to kill my tree, if it's okay. Because it, it was tall enough, I could have reached it, I could have sprayed. Well, what it turned out that those caterpillars feasted on that tree late in its growing season, late in the growing season. So in a late July through August kind of time frame. So the tree was not able to produce as much sugar as it normally would and send it down to the roots. But the following year, it still leafed out just fine. It still grew another 18 inches, which is what it's been averaging. So I don't think it really negatively impacted it. And it was, that was just sort of an experiment. And yet I sort of had to trust the process. Um, 
I think, uh, yeah, trusting the process and being willing to experiment is, you know, tied into that, where do I start kind of thing. Um, so we'll revisit a couple of these questions and a bit about uh, specific plants to recommend, um, but I want to start with one that we got last year. Uh, what native plants would you recommend for a noise barrier? And specifically, this person lived in Charlottesville. Mm. Um, okay, so I'm thinking about heavy leaved, deep green, um, non deciduous plants, right? And the things that immediately come to mind are Ilex opaca. Right, which is the American holly. Um, another one that, uh, of course, it's a tree is, uh, you know, I, I plant the janipers, right? Because um, they're again, they're they're going to stay, they're going to stay green all year. Uh, the cedar wax wings love them. They'll come over and they'll, you know, they they eat the berries every year when during migration. So I'm just trying to think, it, it, you know, because your noise, you're trying to, you're trying to keep, you want that year round. So I, I picked something that was probably broad leafed and, um, you know, and didn't, was not deciduous. Um, okay, we still have some more questions. I know it's 750, these are all great questions. Um, so I'll, I'll keep feeding them and, and, uh you you can uh, let me know if we're what do you think about the questions as well or like our timing and everything um so do popular spray deer repellents also affect pollinators mm -hmm. well i don't know the answer um because i think it varies i in other words you can read on them you can read on the on the spray it'll it'll say insect you know it'll say pet safe and human safe but some of them will say insect safe and i think that's really what you're what you're looking for um you know don't use anything that's a nicotinoid and you know as deer spray i don't think you'd want to do that because that's not great for pollinators but other than that i i think you got to read the label because there's so many different ones and they're all yeah and they're formulated differently Absolutely. This is a great one as well. Uh, they're all great questions. Uh, what qualities or questions should I ask of a landscaper to get started? Um, yeah, so let me just back up a slide. Can. There we go. Um, yeah, so I, this, this program, the CDLP program, I you know, I, I've been through both the level one and the level two certification classes. I'll just say that people who have gone through this class, they know about natural communities, they know about native plants, they understand ecosystems. So I, so that uh, there's a list on this website of every landscaper who is open for business, who you know, has gone, has received the certification. Other than that, you know, it's really up to your personal aesthetic. So what I'd ask is, could I please see your portfolio? Because there's some people that do stuff with, um, you know, with grasses and, yeah, and, and uh, you know, large trees. And, and that's like, that's their aesthetic. And you may say, well, you know, that's not really for me. I. So I would just, I'd ask to see their part, their portfolio and I'd ask for references, right? Make sure that people like the work that they've done. Wonderful. So last few questions, uh, is Escalade a dangerous lawn chemical? I don't know. I, my, I'm going to have to look it, it up. I don't even, yeah, I don't see that question. So, okay. I will go back to your read the, the, bottle but i would also add extension can be a really great tool as well um are, are butterfly bushes native plants and would you recommend them no they're not native and no i don't recommend them <laughs> so, i knew the I mean, answer that, to that one <laughs> yeah i mean that that one is easy and so here so okay back to that funny story about robert jennings coming to my yard right 
and I was, yeah, I, I thought butterfly bushes were native. And he goes, mm, no. So then he sends me like a whole long list of all the different things that I could plant instead. And he really got me hooked on Joe Pie weed, which is gorgeous, right? And just um, really beautiful. And it comes in a lot of different sizes and now a lot of different colors. And, and I would absolutely plant Joe Pie weed every day. <laughs> And, uh, and no, the, the re, okay, so back to the, once you have plant one butterfly bush, you will always have a butterfly bush. So yank it out of there eventually because it'll pop up everywhere in your yard as long as it's flowering. Um, we have a question about honeybees and I need to read this verbatim because it's hilarious. Uh, recently I read that honeybees are great for agriculture, but are bullies in our yards. <laughs> what plants are great for native bees that will not leave them with honeybee PTSD? <laughs> uh, yeah, too bad we can't give prizes for best questions because that, that one's excellent. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. I'll start, I'll start with about 70% of our bees are ground, of our native bees are ground nesters. So they need, um, so a hun they're not going to compete with the honeybees is my point. And they, um, yeah, what I, I, this, okay, so I think I need to phone a friend for this one and say that the Xerces Society has got sort of, again, that list is sort of, as well as, um, uh, I put it up on the, I put it up on the slide. There's a list on the Virginia Native Plants website of the specialist bees. There are, you know, certain bees will only forage on certain plants and um, and it's like, I know that honeybees love clover, for instance, and maybe what you do is you plant some sacrifice clover and that you know that your, um, the honeybees are going to just zoom over to, and then you've got some other specialist plants that are just sort of have that one-to-one -one relationship with, um, you know, with bees that are non-honeybees, which are European, by the way, the honeybees are. Okay, last three questions. Do you okay. have any student-friendly resources? Oh, Blair, you got to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was typing frantically an answer, and I was like, "This is this is a long answer." <laughs> um, so, someone was asking about planting at schools. I work for CBF's education department, um, and honestly, I think the same places we've been referring to you earlier would be a great place to start, like the master gardeners and the master naturalists because those folks are volunteers and they frequently have the time and the skills to come in and help with students. Um, if you are looking for, yeah, if you're looking to design something or like a, stu a school program, I would reach out to our education department. So specifically uh, Karen Mullen and Erin O'Neill would be the people that could help you work through that process. So I can put their contact information in the chat for you, um, but that's a whole other beast, educating students while trying to maintain a garden. Um, I can see Anne is answering a question about cantaloupes having orange skins, are they edible? Second to last question. Uh, yes, they're just perhaps overly ripe. Wonderful. And second to last, where is a great place to order seeds kind of with the, the nurseries? Oh, Lord. Um, so I, I think I've got every seed catalog. Um, my husband keeps threatening to build me a whole different library for just seed catalogs. Um, so I, territorial seed is a good one. Um, oh, Lord. Pine tree. Is another one. It's got a good selection of both um, native plant seeds as well as, um, well, of course, as well as vegetable plants. Uh, give me one more second. I'll think of the third one. It looks. 
Go ahead. While you're thinking, uh, we've actually come to kind of the conclusion of our questions. So oh, good. It's right at eight o'clock too. Perfect. I, the only thing I would like to leave with is Anne. Uh, if you I'm trying to think of a good final question for you, um, if you were to describe yourself as a plant, a native plant, like your personality and <laughs> aesthetic, what would it be? Oh. Okay, so I'd like to think of myself. I don't know if, if other people would think of me like this, but I would like to think of myself as a as an old oak tree and a white oak specifically, right? Really strong branches that are um, can support just swings and people climbing up in them, and you know, kids having a place to climb. So. To, that's sort of me. I'm sort of the, I'm sort of the support structure, I guess. How yes. about you, Blair? <laughs> oh gosh, that's that's challenging. Um, hey, you think about that for one second. I just yes. wanted to say. So Linda said libraries in our area have seed shear, and then that are set up by the master gardeners, which I love that. Um, yeah, seed swaps are are excellent, and and the master. Master Gardeners, as well as the, the individual chapters of Native Plant Societies, as well as the Master Naturalists, all usually have um, either seed swaps or they've got, um, you know, plant sales as part of the way that they fund their chapters. Okay, Blair, your turn, Native Plants. Which one describes you? Last question. Oh, dang, I was coming up with one for you. So <laughs> I would have said for you, Pinkster Azalea, because they're like near the water and like, they're bright and lovely and bring you joy. And obviously all native plants have the deeper roots uh, supporting the soil and you know creating that wonderful mm -hmm. environment for everything around them. So- That's funny um, you think of me as a flowering plant. <laughs> no, you're not a flashy showy person, but it's, it's more about the water. Like I know you, you're into swimming and everything like that. So um, maybe we just leave you guys with that is find that plant that you just feel in your soul as you and put that in your yard and that can be your start. So I think, yeah, we've reached 759. Excellent. This is the conclusion of our presentation. For those of you that asked for the presentation and the PowerPoint, um, that will be sent to you after the program. All right, guys, thanks so much. Take care, bye-bye.